Hello, welcome to my Terraforming Mars Strategy Guide video series. For the sake of easiness, we're just going to continue from where we left the first video off. So we're just gonna start with tip number 11. Tip number 11 and 12 are about colonies, so if you're not playing with colonies, proceed to tip number 13. Tip number 11, buy colonies, especially Luna and Pluto. The colony cards are really good and probably, at least in the early game, the best standard project in the game is the standard project, build a colony for 17 mega credits. I will say that uh, once in a blue moon, Pun intended, all colonies are bad for you and you cannot use any of the resources or anything. After all, they are drafted at random. In that case, maybe don't buy colonies. But in 99 out of 100 games, you should at the very least have one colony. Often the best colony is Luna. <laughs> but other colonies can be very strong as well, depending on the game. Pluto, Ceres, Triton, Callisto are also up there. Honestly, all of the colonies are really good. It, it really depends on the situation. Like, in the late game, Mirana is also really powerful. You can make an argument for all of these colonies, to be honest. Pluto is the go-to colony if you have money income going. Remember the relationship between money income and card draw, like we talked about in the first video? Money income multiplied with card draw, so you need to balance them both. In other words, if you have very little money income, it's hard to spend 17 mega credits on just cards. In this case, Pluto is not as powerful. You could actually make the argument that if you're really desperate trying to get engine building cards, you could just try YOLO and just build a colony in Pluto and try to dig out some engine building cards. This is fair. And although this YOLO play does work sometimes, generally speaking, if you have little to no money income, then Pluto simply dwarfs in comparison to some of the engine building colonies like Ceres or Luna. On the other hand, if you have a bunch of money income, then Pluto is excellent. Even better than Luna in this case. And speaking of Luna, this colony is just always solid. Like we talked about in the first video, if you have the choice between buying a colony and Luna and playing a mediocre card, Luna just wins every single time. Let me try to explain it this way. If Luna was a card, Luna effectively gives you sort of kind of for mega credit production. Two for the placement bonus and two for the colony bonus if people are flying there every single generation. However, in practice, it's a little lower than this because people are not actually visiting Luna every single generation. At least not in the early game as people are simply not set up to trade yet. But as soon as people do get the three energy production to trade with or something, then Luna will pretty much get visited every single generation. Almost, maybe 80% of the time. So placing Luna between three or four mega credit production is pretty fair, I think. And this is not even taking into account the amount of mega credit you actually get when you trade here. I'm only talking about the colony bonus and the placement bonus. So a colony standard project costs 17 mega credits. So imagine a card that you pay 3 mega credits to keep, then the card costs 14 mega credits and it gives you 3 to 4 mega credit production. Something like this. Would I buy this in the first generation? Hell yeah! <laughs> this card is basically Luna. Luna is very good. Let's compare that to some of the god tier mega credit production cards you could get in the early game. So Space Hotels, Luna Exports, Acquired Companies, all of these cards are better than Luna, but to be fair, these cards are excellent in the first generation. Especially Space Hotels, but this is kind of fair because Space Hotels require you to have two Earth tags, and that's why Space Hotels are so good. And Luna Exports is good because it's literally exporting from Luna. Hmm? So even though this card has absolutely nothing to do with Luna, just having Luna in the name makes this card good by association. That's how good Luna is. So if Luna gets visited every single generation, which means that Luna equals 4 mega credit production, then Luna honestly can almost compete with all these god tier cards. But even if we set Luna to just 3 mega credit production, then buying a colony in Luna is nevertheless still a solid play. So if you have really good cards like these in your opening hand, a colony and Luna might not even be needed. However, I, I think still if I have all of these incredible cards in my opening hand, I still would consider buying a colony and Luna. I might just play all of these cards to begin with and then build a colony and Luna on generation two or three. Worth noting, people actually don't really trade in the first few generations. Usually it takes a few generations as the trade income is just so bad to begin with and also it takes a few generations before people get the three energy production or something so they can actually trade. So by following this logic it could actually make sense that you just wait a little bit before buying Luna if you have better engine building cards like these in your hand. Just be careful that the three available slots on Luna doesn't get taken from you before you have a chance to get in on the action. In the groups I've played with it's actually pretty normal that the three available slots on Luna just get taken like immediately in the first generation. Especially in four player games. Being in a four player game and you're the one guy who doesn't get a colony in Luna that that sucks. 
But let's say you are in a group where none of your opponents actually favor Luna, so nobody is building a color named Luna. Then Luna is not as good, because the trade income won't rise as high, which means that Luna might not get visited every generation. In this case, we're back to Luna only being worth 3 Mega Grid Potion. I will say I've played Terraforming Mars in maybe 10 different groups, something like this, and it's only in one of the groups where literally no one put any value on Luna, except for me. It was actually really strange. I had the only colony in Luna, I had it all to myself. So in this case, Luna isn't as good. But even though Luna is less powerful if there's only one colony in Luna, then it opens up the possibility of getting a double colony, or maybe even triple colony in Luna via cards like Research Colony or Spaceport Colony. In other words, if you get a double colony in Luna, you are over the moon. And getting a triple colony in Luna is just out of this world. Almost never happens, but when it does, it's really good. You can even say that it's a play that eclipses all others. All things considered, Luna is still really powerful, and you should seriously consider building a colony in Luna in the first generation every single game. So the standard project build a colony for 17 mega credit, it's actually good. It doesn't even have to be Luna, it could be in one of the others, also reasonable. And if you have colony cards, it's even better. Pretty much all of the cards that says colony somewhere in the text are usually good, especially in the early game. If you have several of these cards and get just a little bit of colony synergy, then it can be actually incredibly good. Just to give you an example, here's the combo I showed you in the first video. I also have a whole episode dedicated to reviewing project cards. Tip number 11.5, a good solid play I often make is to buy a colony as your first action and then you spend three energy to trade as your second action. In other words, if you are considering trading on a colony, then you should really consider to also build a colony there before you trade. And the reason you want to do this in the same turn is so that you don't risk your opponent trading there instead of you or building a colony there themselves as you've just telegraphed like a madman that you intended to trade here. So build a colony first and then trade immediately. Tip number 11. If you're playing with colonies, get three energy production as soon as possible. It's hard to explain but it is somehow just a lot cheaper to spend 3 energy to trade than it is to spend 3 titanium on 9 mega credit. So glass half full, if you want to trade every single generation then a preload card like power generation is just worth like 9 mega credit production which is super good. 9 mega credit production is the same as paying 9 gold every single generation to trade so by this logic power generation is just the best preload in the game if you're playing with colonies. Honestly, I have had games sometimes where I just straight up bought 3 energy production as standard projects because that's how much I value having 3 energy production to trade with. But this is a bit extreme of course to spend 33 mega credit like this. So I wouldn't recommend doing this too often. But if I intend to trade every single generation, then the 33 mega credit I spend is sort of worth 9 mega credit production, so this is not completely awful. That being said, preferably you do want cards that give you energy production. You can also visit Europa to get energy, that's a bit cheaper because 9 instead of 11, or you can buy a colony on Callisto. So tip number 12.5, and this is a bit of a niche scenario, but if you have two space fleets but only two energy production, then you can buy a colony on Callisto to get your third energy production, and then you can trade here with the first spaceship every generation, and then you get a little bit of excess energy to boot, which will be turned into heat late. And worth noting, your opponents cannot really deny you this by flying to Callisto themselves, because when you already have a colony there, then you get three energy, so if they trade there before you do, then you all of a sudden you has 6 energy to trade with with your 2 space fleets instead of just 1, which is even better. What your opponents could do is to just build a colony on Callisto themselves, so when you do this trick they will also get 3 energy, but it is what it is. Tip number 13, some things are better to do at the beginning of a generation and some things are better to do at the end of a generation. Tip number 13 to 16 will be discussed in a lot more detail in episode 6, but here are the shorter, watered down headlines, which to be honest is probably all you need, not gonna lie. Stuff to do as soon as possible in a generation. 1. Milestone and a 2. Getting the last few available TR if a parameter is about to close. 3. Getting the best placement bonus on the map. 4. Claiming a bonus on one of the global parameters. In the first episode we talked about how this is really important to contest these bonuses. 5. Spending your plants before you get hit by a comet. Like, remember this guy? <laughs> yeah, this is why you want to start the generation spending your plants before these cards are just devastating you. 6. Using attack cards, the cards with the red border. This one is not as straightforward, so I'll try to explain it a little bit. Basically, you should steal and decrease opponents' stuff while they still have something to steal or decrease. Especially, you want to burn their plants before they have a chance to spend them. If your opponent has like one energy production, steal it for the love of God before he has a chance to spend that one energy production. There are some exceptions here 
here regarding reducing enemy production, but I'll get back to that in a second. There's actually also this psychological counter argument here. If you start the generation hurting an opponent, maybe that opponent is going to use his attack card on you as payback. Just something to keep in mind. Some people enjoy retaliation. Fucking sadists. And finally number 7, play effect cards giving you X based on opponents Y. They could be like pets or it could be immigrant city. So this is stuff to do as soon as possible in a generation. Now let's look at stuff that's good to do as late as possible in a generation. One, you want to play cards and use action cards where you get X on opponents Y. So this is not like the same as pets and stuff like this, like we just talked about, those were like if Effects. Now what I'm talking about here is stuff like Tull Station, Galilean Way Station, Martian Rails, Greenhouses, Aerosport Tournament and so on. I'm probably forgetting some of these. Media Archives is also a good one. And it should go without saying that cards like Martian Rails, Aerosport Tournament and Media Archives, the cards just gives you mega credit now. Naturally this shouldn't technically be your last action, this would be like your second to last action or something. Because technically the last action should then be to spend the mega credits you get when you play these cards. But Tall Station, however, should literally be your last action of the generation. It like it physically hurts me when I see someone playing Tall Station at the start of generation. Like, why why would you do that? I'm too polite to say anything, but I really cringe and I face palm and I, I'm hurting inside. Like you literally get additional potential value for free if you wait for as long as possible before playing these cards, like Tall Station. So literally play Tall Station or stuff like this at the very last action of the generation, or at least until everyone else has passed. You know. Two, making plays to set yourself up to win a race at the start of the upcoming generation. Like the surprise factor is of course bigger if you wait until the very last minute before you reveal your master plan. This also works even better if you are the first player in the upcoming generation. Three, terraforming with heat resources and action cards. It is technically correct to wait for as long as possible before spending your heat resources because increasing the temperature scale might just be helping your opponent and you want to wait for as long as possible before potentially helping your opponents. I can only think of three exceptions to this rule. A. You can claim a bonus. B. The temperature parameter is closing and you really want to get the last few available TR before it closes completely. And C. You yourself have a card with a temperature requirement not quite being met and spending exactly your heat and increasing the temperature is the last bit you need in order to play that card. 4. Decreasing an opponent's energy production if they are using it for something specific like trading or powering action cards. So if you see an opponent who is using his energy production for something specific, then you want to decrease their energy production as late as possible to do the most damage, preferably after they've already passed the generation. So the eagle-eyed viewer will have noticed that I just told you to use attack cards as soon as possible, but here's the rule of thumb. If they have one energy production, remove it immediately. But if you play with colonies and they have three energy production, or if they are powering some sort of card and they have four energy production, something like this, then you want to wait for as long as possible. And while we are it, you can also make the argument that you should just wait for as long as possible before decreasing enemy production in general. Simply because this will mess up their calculation a little bit. But you know, this is minor things. The most damage you can do is definitely decreasing the energy production exactly when they have passed and they're just, oh, I needed that energy production to trade or something. That's when you can do the most damage. Also a very neat scenario here, but number 5, if your opponent has predators and you have an animal card with no animals on it, make the animal as late as possible, preferably after the predator guy targets another player and eats their animal instead of yours. Or if no one else has any animals, maybe the correct play is to just never create an animal if you have zero animals, that is. And then you can literally just watch the predators starve to death. Okay, now we're talking about really specific examples, but you get the point I'm trying to make. It really does matter which stuff you do at the start of a generation, and it really does matter which stuff you're doing at the end of a generation. Tip number 14, spend only one action on your turn unless you have a reason to spend two actions. Reasons why it's generally better to only take one action on your turn. 1. Your opponent shows your hand before you do. After you see what they are doing, you might make a different play. 2. It essentially gives you more actions in a row, which you can use to do all kinds of things. And 3. If you are starting the upcoming generation, then you'll have even more actions in a row. So why is it better to have many actions in a row? You can surprise claim a milestone, you can claim bonuses without being contested, and most importantly, things are like under your control. Lots of scenarios will benefit you if your opponent shows their hand before you do. So when you're 
starting the upcoming generation, you should use this to your advantage. And also you should be mindful of the player who is starting the upcoming generation, because maybe that guy also watched the boneless strategy guide on YouTube. So here's where it gets a bit tricky because there are some exceptions to this one action per turn rule in general. So when is it better to actually spend two actions on your turn? So number one, the players around the table are playing casually and you have an maybe unspoken rule of taking two actions on your turn to avoid slow playing. This is sometimes the case depending on which group you play in and this is completely fair. Also if you're just playing a casual game on the Mars app on real life, I, I, to be honest I tend to take two actions on my turn quite often. It is quite normal. As long as you know that it is technically correct to only take one action on your turn most of the time, because in a lot of situations it really can make a difference. That being said, there are also situations where it's correct to take two actions on your turn. For example, number two, there could be some sort of race going on. Races could be milestones and awards, the last few available tier, the parameters are about to close, getting the best placement bonus on the map, or maybe a bonus on the global parameter is like only two actions away, then of course you want to grab that. Number three, setting yourself up to an even better placement bonus on the map. Like if you place water and then as your second action you place something next to the water. In this case it also makes sense to take two actions on your turn. And four, build a colony as your first action and trade as your second action. We already talked about this. And number five, playing around stuff like energy tapping and power supply consortium. So what you do is as the first action you create your energy production and then as your second action you spend the energy production immediately. And number six is once again this fucking guy. So, number six, acquiring plants and then building a greenery. So this is how you play around asteroid. So once again, you spend your first action getting the last plants you need and then as your second action, you make a greenery. And seven, if possible, consider spending your mega credit steel and titanium immediately to play around like sabotage, air raiders, hide raiders, something like this. But this is like a little less important, but sometimes it does come into play. Sometimes it's just nice to just spend all your mega credit at once. If like, if this is the plan you have on this generation, why not just do it immediately? So I know that this is a lot of information at once, but uh, here is the point. The point is you want to spend one action on your turn. This should like be second nature to you. If you do spend two actions in your turn, then you must have a reason for doing so. That being said, like we talked about, um, as long as you know that this is technically the correct way to do it, then well, you can still just play casually and take two actions on your turn, it's fine. It really depends on how much you want to win and how the players around the table feel about this. Tip number 14.5. In the last generation, it is extra important to only take one action on your turn. The reason why this is important is, first of all, well, what if it's not really the last generation? Perhaps your opponent is surprised closing the game, or perhaps he is surprised not closing the game, which can be equally as devastating. And two, slow playing is crucial for fighting for a war. If, for example, the minor award has been started, it's really nice to know how much you need to win the award and how much titanium you can actually afford to spend on Jovian amplifiers and stuff like this. Number three, if you pass the generation before your opponents, then they might burn your plants or decrease your plant production, denying you that plus one greenery from the exit round. Like, remember this guy, the bird person, this guy that just intentionally really waits until you pass the last generation and then he just removes your plants or plant production, preventing you from getting that plus one greenery. It's really annoying. If you are actually this uh, bird person yourself, it brings us to number four, you should wait for as long as possible before removing opponents' plant production, especially in the last generation. Basically all of these annoying little mind games, they just work a lot better if you are the last one to pass the last generation. So these are the reasons why it's especially important to only take one action on your turn in the last generation. In other words, you shall not pass the last generation before your opponent, if possible. Are there exceptions when it comes to the last generation as well? Yes, here they are. When is it better to spend two actions on your turn in the last generation? Number one, you're in a rush to start the last award. Two, you're in a rush to get the last bit of available TR before the game closes. Three, you want the good placement bonus. Or actually, if it's one of those games where the map is just filling up like crazy, then maybe you just want a placement bonus. Like it sometimes happens that there are only maybe one good city spot left or something like this. In this case, it's of course also a race to get the last good placement bonus on the map. Tip number 15, card sequence. Do not play a card until you need the card for something. 
So before we talk about this, I should just real quick cover my bases. We talked about this in the first video, but naturally engine building cards should be played in the early to mid game. Because like we talked about in the early game you need money income. And you should start grabbing VP when there are like 4 generations left and pure VP should be played in the last generation. Jovian Amplifier should also usually be played in the last generation, except for IO Mining Industries. There are actually a few exceptions when it comes to Jovian Amplifier, we will look at these in the next video, but generally speaking this is the correct way to go. The reason why IO Mining Industries is good to play early on is because it gives you a ton of engine. 2 Titanium production and 2 Mega Credit production. Very good for building engine. So if you want to, you can actually do it like this. Uh, I, I do this to some extent, but you can literally just make a pile with late game cards and play them in the last few generations. It's very good to divide your cards like this, either have them in your hand, on the table or something, so you have some idea of which card you want to play here and now, and which card you really don't want to play until the late game. So here are some reasons why some cards are just better to be played later on. First of all, Mega Credit is worth more in the early game compared to the same amount of Mega Credit in the late game. And two, perhaps you pick up some discount cards during the game. In other words, why would you play Interstellar Colony Ship in Generation 3 when you could have played it for Mega Credit cheaper in the last generation because you picked up, let's say, Earth Catapult and Space Station. Number three, in addition to becoming cheaper, some cards can actually also become worse more if you play it later. In the next tip I will elaborate a lot more on this specific concept. Number four, you also don't want to show your hand until you have to. Like if you're playing draft, your opponents might pass your science tags or green tags because they don't know you have, let's say, Venusian animals. If they know you have this card played, then they might not give you science tags, right? So getting back to the point here, you do not want to play a card until you need it for something. You want to play Colonizer Training Camp as late as possible but still within the max 5 oxygen requirement. So probably you want to play this when the oxygen is around 4 or 5, something like this. Don't play discount cards before you need the discount effect. Don't play Ecological Zone and Decomposers until you plan on playing green tags. Do not play Herbivores until you plan on making some greeneries. Well okay this one is a bit different because you go also decrease enemy plant production. So if you really want to be a sadist, you can play it a little sooner, which I can get behind. Don't play Venusian animals before you plan on playing science tags or benefit from having animals in some way. Could be like meat industries or it could be large convoy, although I will say that in most situations large convoy is actually also better to play in the late game. Could also be Miranda or maybe you just need the science tag to play something nice like anti-gravity technology for example. So as a rule do not play a card until you have a clear reason to actually play the card. If the reason is purely victory point then you should play the card in the last generation instead of what you doing. Tip number 16, some cards are potentially worth more when played later on. This can be a number of different things, but the biggest examples that comes to mind is like science tags or green tags. So science tag will increase in value if you pick up like Mars University, Olympus Conference or Venusian animals. Green tags will increase in value if you pick up like bio enhancers, meat industries, decomposers, ecological zone and so on. This is why I sometimes hold on to cards like research in the hope that I will during the game pick up up stuff like Olympus Conference, Mars University, Venusian Animals. So basically you do have to make an assessment. Do you want to play research now or do you want to gamble in the hope that you could get extra value from playing it later on? What I do is I probably hold on to it for as long as possible until I run out of good plays to make. If I'm running low on cards or if the cards in my hand are just very bad to play right now then I might consider to just play research now. But holding on to science cards in order to play them later can be really good and remember research has two science tags. Naturally it depends what the science tag actually does for you, like if you need to play it now, of course just play it now. Green tags are another example of cards that just might increase in value the longer you hold on to it. This is why I consider it a deadly sin to play advanced ecosystem before the last generation. So firstly this card has literally only VP on it and secondly if you play it earlier you might be missing out on some of the free VP you get from green tags like these cards here. And to be honest this could be a lot of points we're talking about. All of a sudden advanced ecosystem is just worth 3 plans and 5 victory points instead of only 3 victory points. Other cards also get better over 
over time, not because of their attacks, but because of what they do when you play it. So I'm talking about these cards here. There are probably more of these that I'm forgetting, so you might be thinking, well, you should just always wait for as long as possible before playing these cards. And yeah, usually that's correct, but it's not always completely correct, because remember there's also this aspect of mega credit being worth more in the early game compared to the late game. Could be that you just desperately need the mega credit right now in order to make a good play. Could also be that you need the science tag from molecular printing to play anti-gravity technology, or you need the earth tag from media archives to play cartel or something like this. Could also be you need the plants from greenhouses to get the bonus on the oxygen scale. So in certain situations it's better to play these cards a little bit sooner, but as a rule you want to play these as late as possible, unless you have a good reason. There are many examples to be honest, like resource amplifiers or robotic workforce could also get better over time, and then it gets a little bit tricky once again because production is something you really want to get earlier on. Which leads me to tip number 17. Play to maximize amplifying cards like insects, cartel and satellite. These cards are very very good. Like Often people feel that the reason they lost the game of Terraforming Mars is because the other guy got plus one milestone more than me, or they got one more Jovian amplifier than me, something like this. But I would make the argument that often these resource amplifiers are even more impactful than Jovian amplifier. People just don't think about it this way because they can't really picture how many VP playing satellites actually ended up giving. Like we mentioned in the first video, all of these amplifying cards are by nature situational. However, most of them are just so aggressively statted that they're just good in most games. And even in a few games they're just stupidly overpowered and they will literally win you the game. This is why you really have to pay attention to these cards in your games. So if you have some sort of amplifying card like insects or cartel or satellites then naturally you want to play to maximize the effect. Meaning that if you play cartel of course you for the most part want to play all the earth tags before you play it. Within reason. And when I say within reason just to give you an example you probably don't want to play terraforming Ganymede just so you could get plus one mega credit production from satellites. It's not always the case however because there's also this element of the sooner you get it down the better because remember production is better the earlier you get it. So it's kind of a balancing act. Sometimes it's better to play cartel with five earth tags in generation four than it is to play cartel with seven earth tag in generation six. It really depends on a lot of things. It depends on how long the game is gonna be. It depends if you had a nice alternative play to make instead of doing the five earth tag cartel and if I had a card like insects in my hand I just keep a bunch of plant production tags in my hand then I still focus on money income and stuff but then when the six oxygen requirement of insects have been met then I just play all the plant tags and then I just slam down insects. Sometimes you can of course also play the plant tags a bit sooner if you have some nice money income going. If you're thinking which of these cards are the strongest, it's very hard to determine as all of these cards are by nature very situational. That being said, I'm still willing to say that like Lunar Mining, Cartel, Miranda Resort, Toll Station, Satellites, Insects are S tier cards with a good. I admit Miranda Resort is a little bit expensive when it comes to building your engine, but nevertheless the card itself comes with a Jovian tag, it's pretty cheap, so worst case scenario you just play it in the late game and feel fine about it. Toll Station and Galilean Way Station are better than more players are actually in the game but even in two player games you can get quite nice value from these cards. It's just more situational in two player games. I also considered awarding a go to Luna Metropolis and Gyropolis but for the purpose of engine building they're just very expensive so you really have to think twice before deciding to build your engine using these cards. That being said I have won a bunch of games on the back of a god like Gyropolis. Like in the right circumstance this card is absolutely disgusting. Speaking of cards that can be very expensive expensive but can give you a ton of mega credit production. We also got Interplanetary Trade and Sulfur Exports. Kinda the same story with these cards. I almost didn't put Sulfur Exports on the left with this sort of bad cards but not really. But it just feels like it is a bit expensive for what it gives you. Zeppelins is also a good card if somebody is going for cities but what really brings this card down for me is the 5 oxygen requirement. I mean that is rough, especially considering that the mega credit production is better in the early game and in my experience oxygen is actually the last parameter to move in the early game. So this card can be a little bit awkward and even if you yourself are going for cities you still kinda don't want to keep this card in your opening hand because it just might take too long before you reach the 5 oxygen requirement. 
but the redeeming fact of this card is that it also has one victory point attached to it so there is a point in the mid game where you play this card and you feel really good about it and to be fair in certain games where you just top deck zeppelins at just the right time then this card can give you a lot of value worms we talked about in the first video i i don't like worms so even though the resource amplifiers generally are really good also keep your eye out for cards that just straight up gives you mega credit so we're back to these <laughs> so do not underestimate these cards if you do the math these cards just might give you just as much or maybe even more than some of the mega credit production amplifiers it's just it doesn't look as shiny right it, when you see oh cartel 5 mega credit production ah i want this once again these cards are of course also situational but generally speaking i just feel like these resource amplifiers and also these cards generally speaking they're good i should also quickly mention robotic workforce like if you combo this card with for example medical lab or Jeropolis, like seriously i've had games where my entire game plan was just to make the biggest Jeropolis the world have ever seen and then following that up with an equally big robotic workforce tip number 18 play the good cards taking into account the number of players in the game first of all it goes without saying that you just want to play the best cards naturally terraforming mars is a pretty well balanced game i think honestly but there are still some cards that are better and some cards that are worse and recognizing the good cards from the bad cards is an acquired skill that comes from intuition or experience so you can just try to math your way out of it like i mentioned in the first video just instinctively i know that indentured workers and lunar exports are keepers in my opening hand whereas error break ammonia asteroid and interstellar colony ship are not keepers I'll talk more about evaluating cards in general in episode 8, but right now what I really want to talk about is the good card and the bad cards considering how many players are in the game. I don't think a lot of players realize this, but some cards are simply better in 2 player games, whereas other cards are simply better in 5 player games. And once again, a lot of this comes down to the fact that 2 player games are longer in terms of generations, where 5 player games are shorter in terms of generations. In 2 player games the following types of cards are very good and you should consider playing these cards. 1. Attack cards, cards with the red border. These are just some examples and of course keep in mind that hackers are just generally also better than the early game because it comes with mega credit production but basically almost all of the attack cards are just really effective in two player games as you're damaging your one opponent more than the cost you actually pay to play the card. But then you might be thinking well you're also hurting an opponent if you're playing a 5 player game but the difference is that in a 5 player game you're only attacking 25% of your opponents whereas in a 2 player game you're hurting 100% of your opponents with attack cards it's really just the one opponent but you get what i mean on top of that if you use an attack card on an opponent in a five player game you also put a target on your back and that player will likely retaliate on you rather than spending their attack cards on another player in two player games attack cards will always hit you like no matter what you do you can't th there's no one else two Greedy cards also tend to be better in two player games because two player games are longer in terms of generations compared to a five player game. Which means that you can get away with more greed. So the best examples I can give you is like AI Central, Interplanetary Trade or Anti-Gravity Technology. These are extremely greedy cards and they are very good in two player games but in five player games maybe not so much. I will say that if you can get away with it and play them pretty fast these cards are of course also very good in five player games. Just know that these cards come with a lot more risk in five player games. AI yeah, Central is straight up one of the best cards in the game in a 2 player game but in a 5 player game it might be too greedy because AI yeah, Central is expensive. It costs 21 mega credits, 1 energy production and it requires 3 science tags. And before you look around suddenly you spend the first 6th generation creating engine, playing science tags and then playing AI yeah, Central and then the game is just over because you're playing a trash 5 player game and then you lose horribly because you haven't had time to make the transition from greedy engine to point grabbing. This is what I mean when I say you should be careful of greedy cards in 5 player games. But in Two player games AI Central is one of the best cards. It's kind of the same story with interplanetary trade. This card can also be very strong but it kind of takes a few generations to play all the different tags in order to make this card worth it and also the card itself is very expensive 27 mega credit. So you could also walk into the same trap of just making engine for 6 generation then you finally play interplanetary trade and then the game is over in 7 generations. Anti-gravity technology kind of the same thing it takes a while to set up the proper science tag synergy. Other examples of cards that are better in two player games are simply card draw cards. For exactly the same reasons as we talked about, card draw cards are just super good in two player games. The thing is the game that lasts for many generations like 13 or 14 or something like this, the best strategy in these games are just the card strategy. And as we've talked about, usually the longer games in terms of generations are two player games. So these are the types of cards that are just very good in two player games. But let's talk about five player games. The following types of cards are very good in five player games and should be played 
most of the time. One, cards that gives you something based on opponent's tags or your opponent's floaters or something like this. I'm talking Tall Station, Quantum Communications, Galilean Way Station, Tharsis, Poseidon, just to give you some examples. It's not in every game that these cards are just broken in five pair games. Naturally, you still have to actually count your opponent's tags and so on. Once again, these cards are situational. I should point out that just because you have four opponents, it doesn't mean that you get four times the value from Tall Station. It's not quite like this because two players in a two player game usually have a lot more cards played than the people in a five player game. That being said, there's no doubt in my mind that statistically these cards are usually better in five player games. Like literally often the best card in the game in five player games is Tall Station. It, it's insane in five player games. It can be at least. Two, city synergetic cards to a lesser extent. Like in the same spirit, you could also argue that Tharsis and city synergy cards in general are slightly better in five player games than two player games. However, this one is not as clear a thing because in two player games, sometimes there are more cities than there would be in a five player games. But once again, statistically, I think these are still slightly better in five player games. And three, cards that gives you terraform rating. Like seriously, in five player games, people just grab TRR faster than toilet paper during a pandemic. Like it's crazy. The thing is terraform rating gives you both mega credits and VP and you need both pretty quickly in the event that you'll be playing a short games with few generations. Terraform rating is also good in two player games but I kind of feel like they are extra important in five player games. So these are the types of cards that generally speaking are better in five player games. Tip number 19, don't be afraid to use standard projects but use them wisely. Standard projects are there to be used. The way the game works is that cards are more efficient compared to standard projects. However, you don't always have the right card you need for the situation. Most of these standard projects are sort of weak, so you kind of need to have a clear purpose in mind when playing them. The trick is to know exactly when standard projects are worth it. So here are the boneless guide to using standard projects. I mean at this point, why the hell not? First of all, it goes without saying that standard projects gets a lot better if you have standard technology, especially when you play it with the Colonies expansion. But let's assume you do not have this card. In that case, when is it good to actually make standard projects? Sell patterns. You should sell bad cards, but only the second you need that one mega credit to buy something. And even if you are buying a card for 3 mega credit and then you regret it, happens to the best of us, there's no shame in selling that card again for 1 mega credit. It's better than just never using it, right? So the reason you want to hold on to your cards until you actually need that 1 mega credit is that the dead card in your hand actually might end up being worthwhile. Perhaps you pick up a lot of discount cards or green tech synergy or you just pick up a card that requires the tag of the card you intend on selling or something like this. It could also be that you simply need cards in your hand, even the dead cards, just so you have something to cycle. It could be Pluto Colony Bonus, it could be Mars University or Sponsored Academies. Power Plant. Only thing I'll say about this standard project is if you need it, you need it. It is quite expensive for 11 mega credits but it is something you buy in a lot of games if you have to. Also like we talked about earlier, if you're playing with colonies you desperately need 3 energy production. But buying 3 power plants, like I said, is a bit extreme. More realistically you get maybe 2 energy production from preludes or cards or something. And in that case it's entirely reasonable to just buy the last energy production you need so you can trade. In fact this would be a good play. And once again if you are playing with colonies you can also get energy a little cheaper by trading on Europa. Then we got Asteroid for 14 mega credits and then we got the Venus standard project air scrapping for 15 mega credits. These two are very similar I think which is why I bundled them together. Both of them sucks man. <laughs> Like these should only be played if you have a really clear purpose in mind. So like we talked about, a TR is roughly worth 8 mega credits, so buying Asteroid is overpaying by 6. And air scrapping is overpaying by 7. I can think of only 3 scenarios where you actually buy this trash. So let's start with Asteroid. Never buy this unless 1. You're close to a bonus. If you can grab the water placement bonus off of this, then it is worth it. The heat production bonus is sometimes worth it if you're desperate, I guess. Like, I mean, if a heat production in the early game is worth 5 mega credits and a TR is worth 8, that's only 13. And the standard project costs 14, so like minus 1 still, it's, uh, it's not that good. But sometimes you're desperate and there's also this aspect of you don't want to give the bonus to your opponent. And two, you need to close the game. In the previous video, in tip number eight, we talked about the value of actually closing the game early to punish the greedy player. At the start of the game, this standard project is just way too expensive. But maybe in the last generation, maybe the last two generation, if you need like three more steps to close the game, fine. I actually do this sometimes. It might just be something you have to do in order to win the game. And three, you have a card in your hand with a temperature requirement. It has to be a really good 
good card to warrant this terrible asteroid standard project, like farming or trees or fish or something, maybe tundra farming, but otherwise it is simply not worth it. Air scrubbing is pretty much the same, it will have to be like the Venusian animals or the terraform rating bonus on the Venus scale before you even consider buying this trash. Maybe Ishtar mining, I don't know. You get the point. As you probably gathered by now, I consider these two standard projects the worst standard projects in the game. Then we got the Aquifier. If we do the math, this standard project is also a bit underwhelming. It costs 18, gives a tier R worth 8 and a placement bonus worth, let's be generous and say 4. So that's 12, so if you buy it for 18, then it's like minus 6 in value, so it's not good. However, even though the math is also bad on this one, there are a number of situations where I will actually buy a water. First of all, remember that there are only 9 waters to be placed on Mars, and honestly, a few of those waters usually go already in the first generation. So this means that if you have a card with water requirement, then it can be okay to maybe like buy one of these or maybe two of these in order to satisfy the requirement of the card. But the Aquifier Standard Project is really expensive, so once again it will have to be the really good card to warrant such desperation. Pretty much has to be like kelp farming or penguins. Capital or algae are also worth mentioning, but it's almost not worth it. And number two could also be that you have some sort of water synergy going on. It could be like Neptune or Arctic algae. Three, or again, you want to close the game and water is the last parameter to close, you can play the water to close the game. Four, you can get like a, an epic water placement bonus. What I mean specifically is that if you pay the 18 mega credits and buy water as your first action, then as your second action, you can do something nice next to the water you just placed. This is the redeeming factor of water is that you have two actions, so you can spend your first action on placing the water and your second action on placing something next to the water. Okay, now we get to the slightly better standard projects. Let's talk about greeneries and cities. Once again, just to get it out of the way, if oxygen is the last parameter to close and you want to close the game, then naturally planting greeneries makes sense. And also if the oxygen parameter is about to close, maybe you want the last few available TR on the oxygen scale. Or maybe you can get a temperature bonus on the oxygen scale, then maybe it's worth making a greenery to do this. Could also be that it has some cards with high oxygen requirements, could be birds or insects or sibilants. So we kind of already talked about this, but here's where greeneries and cities are different. Five, you can make cities and greeneries in the mid to late game to get victory points. In the late game it's actually pretty cost effective to have a few cities and build greeneries around them. Like we mentioned in the previous video, greeneries are like worth approximately three victory points in the late game if you play them next to your cities. If you place them next to two of your cities, greeneries could be worth four victory points and so on. And to be honest, this is not bad for 23 mega credits in the late game. Not to mention that you also get the placement bonuses. So truth be told, in the late game your cards actually have to be pretty good to compete with this. Like we mentioned in the previous video, you really have to do the math and figure out is it better to play my cards or is it better to just keep spamming cities and greeneries in the late game. So standard project cities and standard greeneries are not good for engine building but it is a very nice way to get victory points. This is why it's better to play these standard projects in the last half of the game. The exception of course is if you have a bunch of city synergetic cards. Then what you can do is just to place a bunch of cities early on and build your engine this way. But to be clear it has to be some of the really good city synergetic cards to actually warrant this strategy. I'm talking pretty much like Immigrant City, Martian Rails, Arthasis. Like I think you have to have one of these. You probably also need a little bit extra. It could be like pets, rover construction, standard technology or zeppelins or something like this. We'll talk more about the city strategy in the next video but the point here is that standard cities and greeneries is stuff you want to look at in the mid to late game because they are mainly a way to get victory points. And the only exception here is if you have six city synergetic cards then you can also build your engine with cities. Then if we we're playing with colonies. The last standard project is to build a colony for 70 mega credits. We talked about it earlier. In my opinion, this is very good. In the early game, you just have to do the math to assess if it's better to actually just build a colony for 17 or it's better to play one of your cards in your hand. Remember that the card itself costs three mega credits just for the patent. So when you kind of want to compare it, so the colony costs 14 and not 17. So when you look at it this way, often the best play is to just build a colony on Ceres or Luna or something. And then when you get your engine up and running, Pluto is also really good. Tip number 20, don't keep cards in your opening hand that has a crazy requirement unless... 
So the last thing I want to mention today is for new players mostly and that is just be careful don't keep cards in your hand that has some sort of crazy requirement like birds or trees or lake marineers or open city. I would literally never keep these cards in my opening hand unless you have like the ecology experts preloads and trees or something but you know almost never I will keep these cards in my opening hand. So kelp farming is like a card I might consider keeping. It's almost sort of worth it because there are so few steps when it comes to water but in my opening hand I probably still wouldn't keep this. We could also take this step further and say that you should never keep a card you're not planning to play this generation and while this is a good tip for beginners it doesn't really reflect the whole truth. The really good players actually do keep a lot of late game cards in their hand it's just you have to know when to do it so there's no really correct answer on this one this is a lot of gray area so all I can do is just share my thoughts on this. So I would put it like this in the early game only keep mid to late game cards if one your economy is strong enough to pay the three mega credit pattern without tanking your engine if you have a bad engine and then you start buying late game cards and keeping them in your hands then they're like dead cards forever and then you might just be drowning yourself two the card benefits you a lot when you then finally do play it jovian amplifiers is a good example just know that the cards you are buying in the early game and not playing they are not actually worth three mega credits for the pattern three mega credits in the early game is worth more than three mega credits in the late game because in the early game you're like investing these three mega credits on everything cool and then in the late game it might be worth maybe more like 10 mega credits so if you feel like the card is worth more than the mega credits you stand to lose for buying it so early then you should keep it and to be honest when i play terraform mars i actually do tend to keep a lot of cards that become powerful later i actually watched some of my replays recently because i intend to do some commentary of replays where i played the online mars app just to give you some examples i had a 264 games where i kept insects in ecological zone already in generation 2 but in this game i had really nice engine building cards also so i felt like i could definitely get away with it i don't know how many victory points these cards ended up giving me but it was a ton an absolute ton but then recently i had a 278 game in this game i actually didn't buy any late game cards in the early game but i think that's more because they didn't really present themselves to me so in this game the latest i bought like a mid to late late game cards I think that would be decomposers but that was on generation 8 so this is definitely not the early game anymore I definitely would have also bought victory point generating cards like ecological zone if I had seen them it kind of illustrates my point that there's no real clear answer to this one if you want to watch these games with my commentary they should be on my channel already it should be episode 16 I think examples of late game cards you might want to keep early so we talked a little bit about this but first of all Jovian amplifiers I feel like a lot of players just agree that these cards can generate an absolute bunch of victory points in the late game which means that they are probably worth to keep a lot of the times i don't always keep these in the early game it also depends i think i would always keep iron mining industry in the early game it's just too good to pass up gives you a lot of engine gives you a lot of vp in the late game other examples of cards you might want to keep could also be these juicy science tax cards like like anti-gravity technology ai central quantum extract and mass converter once again this would also depend on how many science tax i have in my hand and if my economy can handle potential dead cards in my hand and stuff like this because keeping some of these cards I just mentioned is essentially a gamble because I cannot know if I will actually get the last science text I need to actually play this. It could also be some of the good plant production cards. It could be like ecology research, nitrophilic moss and maybe if you have like let's say two plant tags in your hand or something then I would seriously also consider keeping insects or nitrogen rich asteroid. Other examples of cards I might keep in the early game could be some of the green tech amplifiers maybe not in my opening hand but still pretty early on i would seriously consider keeping these these are very good so these are just examples of cards i might want to keep early on in my games there's really no clear answer to this one it just comes down to intuition and comes down to can your economy actually handle it also comes down to the fact that you shouldn't keep cards you can't play it unless you have a very good reason to keep them or maybe you're just a reckless gambler in that case you're allowed bonus tip number one if you play draft hate drafting is a thing be very careful what you give to your opponent that's basically what hate drafting means it is of course better to focus on the cards that will help you the most but if none of the available cards are important then you can choose the jovian tag just so that the other guy doesn't get the jovian tag or you can keep immigrant city just so the city guy doesn't get immigrant city and so on bonus tip 1.5 synergy play all the cards that synergizes with each other you should always look for synergy when playing terraforming mars or in real life i guess bonus tip 1.5 
A. Watch episode 4 in my Terraforming Mars video series where I talk about synergy. Bonus tip 1.7. Focus on playing the strong cards and for the most part ignore the bad cards. Bonus tip 1.9.pi.apple. Watch episode 8 of my video series where I rate most of the cards from S tier to trash tier. In other words, feel free to check out these other videos if you feel like it. I can't promise all of them are available on my channel yet, but sooner or later I think all of these will be in my channel. There's a link to the playlist in the description. As you probably guessed by now, this video series will probably take longer to watch than actually sitting down and playing probably maybe in several games of Terraforming Mars yourself, which is a long time. So if you want to see some gameplay instead, you can check out video 16 to 19, where I do commented playthroughs. To be honest, I don't really care about high scores in Terraforming Mars. I don't think anybody really does. But that being said, the 278 game is probably the highest scoring game you'll ever see on YouTube, especially considering this is like the online app where it only comes with vanilla and prelude. Generally, you can achieve higher scores if you get more expansions. Like if you play with colonies and preludes, 300 is definitely within reach. If you have any other tips than the tips I mentioned here, or if you agree or disagree with any Anything, feel free to mention in the comments. I'm game discussing all of this with you. Also, if you know of any other Terraform Mars strategy guides, then feel free to also write that in the comments, then I will add it to the description. Like, if you want to, I'm serious, you can just shamelessly promote your own Terraform Mars content. I really don't mind. I welcome the idea of this being the place from which you can find all the Terraform Mars guides and so on. I purposely didn't watch or read any other Terraform Mars guide before making my own, because I thought it would be more fun to share my own view of the game rather than just repeating what other wise men have said. But now that I have made this guide, I'll happily watch some of the other stuff you sent me. Probably I missed something, and then in the very likely event that I actually learned something new, I would talk about it in episode 10 called Feedback, because this is a video I haven't made yet. Thank you so much to Fuxilius and the Stronghold Games for making my favorite board game. This game came out in 2016. I think it says a lot about this board game that so many players are still playing it, like years later. And it also says a lot about the game that a guy like me just spent three months of his life making this strategy guide like nobody really asked for. I think it speaks to how good the game is or, or maybe I'm just a weird person.